Dandelions were his favorite thing to draw. He especially liked the flower because unlike other flowers, dandelions bloom twice, once to reveal an explosion of bright sunny yellow and again to unveil a fluffy cotton ball of gentle seeds that his late mother told him carried wishes to far-off lands. Spotted with evening sunlight that crept through the twisted trees above, Theo Clove sat cross-legged on the ground with a pencil in one hand and sketchbook in the other, doodling those exact flowers as they swayed back and forth in the gentle spring breeze. His meticulous, almost photorealistic sketch and back pain suggested he had been in this position for roughly about four hours. However, Theo hadn't noticed since he was so focused on capturing the blooms before him. Theo had honeycomb brown wavy hair with matching sun-kissed freckles on soft tan skin. He wore a loose-fitted white peasant shirt with dark hunter green corduroy overalls covered in paint stains. On the front pocket of his overalls sewn into the thick material was an embroidered yellow dandelion, Theo's artistic solution to fixing a hole he made after pulling on a loose string. On his feet were brown lace boots that began to feel a bit too small on his feet. Emerald green eyes flickered back and forth between the page and the sight in front of him, until a blur of black feathers swooped down and plucked one of the flowers he was drawing. Hey, I was drawing that! He sighed defeatedly, and with a grunt began to massage the back of his neck. Maybe dad was right. My neck is killing me. For most of his life, minus a few years, Theo lived with his father in the northernmost part of Rookswood, just south of the mountains, far away from any form of society. Not that Theo minded, he was too young to remember what living in the city was like. Besides, the forest offered him a myriad of things to do. He could draw some plants, observe the wildlife, paint a beautiful sunset, find some more plants to draw, see the same fox he saw the previous day, and paint another sunset and draw another interesting plant, and… well, you get the idea. If it weren't for Theo's creativity, he probably would have gone mad from the intense isolation. Yes, he had his father, but he's always had his father. He yearned for something different, something to break the monotony of the same boring schedule every single day. Speaking of things breaking, his ears picked up the sound of a horrid metallic whirring in the distance. A smile crept up onto his face as he thought, no way, he hasn't visited in years. Theo tucked his pencil behind his ear, slapped his sketchbook shut, and sprinted towards the cottage he called home, mindlessly forgetting about his soreness. The cottage was a large two-story building made of a mixture of materials, mostly brown wood with some cobble and teal-colored tiles for the roof. The square windows were stained in orangey-yellow, and the glass was divided by some black steel that created intricate swirled constellation patterns. Flowering thorny vines strangled the stained windows and framed the robin-egg blue doors. Next to the front door was what looked to be a wiry metal tree covered in glass leaves buried in a terracotta plant with a few words carved into the hardened clay that read, Welcome to the home of William Harmony and Theo Clove. On the opposite side of the door were two chairs and a table with an unfinished game of chess on it. And yes, they were aware they were using a checker piece to replace a black knight. Theo's father told them he had lost the piece when he was younger and has been using the round porcelain disc as a replacement ever since. Theo offered to make a clay knight chess piece to replace it, but his father told him not to worry about it. Something about it being a reminder to not lose anything else. Long story short, Theo made the chess piece anyway. On the topic of his father, as soon as Theo swung the door open, a wonderful aroma of sweet hot chocolate filled his nose, and was that peppermint? Swiftly closing the door behind him, he followed his nose to the kitchen, where a man in his mid-thirties was tending to something on a gaslit stove. A mop of chestnut brown coiled curls flopped over his brow, and a pair of silver-rimmed glasses rested underneath those curls on pale skin. He wore a long, dark, cobalt blue coat that stopped at his ankles with silver embroidery lining the seams and sleeves. Underneath, he wore a creamed-colored Victorian shirt with a dark brown vest that matched his knee-high lace-up combat boots. Unlike Theo, whose hands and knees were covered in dirt, paint, and lead, the man Theo called father was surprisingly extremely clean for someone who lived out in the middle of the woods. Brilliantly blue eyes landed on Theo, and the man said, Hey dandelions, mind grabbing me the mugs from the top cupboard? He focused a bit more on his son's face. What's gotten you so excited? Spot a new bird or something? Theo shook his head. He left his sketchbook on the counter and grabbed two of the three mugs from the cupboard. No, I came here to tell you Eric's here. I heard his land sailor heading this way. He placed the mugs beside his father and looked down at the pot of hot chocolate, noting the amount in the pot. You knew he was coming? His father pulled out a silver watch from his pocket. Later. Not right now, though. He began pouring the warm beverage into the mugs. Grab me the other mug, will ya? As soon as Theo placed the third mug beside his father, both of them heard a loud knock at the door. I'll get it! Theo exclaimed, not even thinking twice as he rushed back towards the front door. Theo, wait! God! His father exclaimed, trying to hold in a line of explicits as he inattentively missed the mug and poured boiling hot chocolate all over his hand.
Theo, excited to talk to somebody who wasn't his father, swung open the front door. Standing on the front porch was an extremely tall, muscular man with striking amber eyes. He wore a faded red royal military coat with dark rose-colored lapels. Lining the bottom trim of his weathered jacket were golden embroidered diamond shapes, and on his feet were a pair of well-worn, enormous dark brown and gold cavalier boots. Generally speaking, he was the kind of man who embodied what he preached and wore it proudly on his sleeve, quite literally. On the back of his jacket was a massive patch with a K and R between two pieces of a broken thorny crown sewn in black. Theo knew it as the symbol of something called the Knave Rebellion. He didn't know much about it, other than that his father and his friends were a part of it, and that it was meant to defeat a great evil somewhere down south. The man grinned widely. Hey, dandelions. My god, you've gotten so big. Theo felt his father come up behind him and gently pushed him to the side. His father said, Eric Eugene Diamond, you said you wouldn't be here until much later. He muttered, like two hours later. Yeah, well, Eric replied and he shrugged. I just couldn't wait to see this one. He roughly ruffled Theo's hair. Ow, 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 ow. Theo's hand flew to the back of his neck. Eric pulled his hand away and quickly apologized. Oh, right, sorry, artist pains. I'm used to having kids your age deal with sword pains. Theo felt his father put his arm over his shoulders, and his father said, Yeah, well, he won't be touching a sword until he's 18. Wait, Theo protested. Didn't you say I could start learning to use one once I turned 16? His father replied, When it comes to teaching a person how to use a weapon, you never start with the actual instrument. You work your way up to the item that can end someone's life, not start with it. Eric smirked at Theo's father. William? When was the last time you used a sword? William's silence and glaring eyes said enough to Theo, who held in a laugh as he witnessed the interaction. It felt nice to have someone in his corner in moments like these. Theo's eyes wandered behind Eric as he noticed a giant brass vehicle parked in front of his home. He exclaimed, No way, you actually got it working? Theo once again took off running. Theo, it might be unstable. As William stepped out, he felt a hand on his chest. Eric sternly said, Let the kid live a little, will ya? William sighed, feeling slightly defeated. I just... I know, Eric replied. He looked towards Theo, who at this point was on the giant machine. The vehicle was called a land sailor, a metal sailboard powered by two rockets at the end that used quartzite striking as a power source. In layman's terms, quartzite striking was a form of energy discovered by two humans named the Curie brothers about 150 years ago. It worked by taking a crystal, in this case quartzite, and striking it with a metal hammer. The strike would then generate an electrical charge that could be harnessed and used to power all sorts of machinery. There was just one issue in the land sailor's case. It was powering a vehicle. It wasn't an issue when it came to powering lighting fixtures and buildings because the electricity was harnessed in a quartzite generator and then evenly distributed through wiring and various chambers. In the land sailor's case, it was used as a fuel source, so the energy distribution system tended to be a bit janky since there wasn't much padding between when the electricity was harnessed and when it was used to power the sailor. Hence, the vehicle was a bit rough around the edges in transit. Eric walked over to Theo and gently pulled him off the board. Okay, slow down there, Captain Dandelions. I'll teach you how to drive it later. Now, get off. I don't want you to hurt yourself. William protested, absolutely not. You will not teach my son how to drive that unpredictable jumble of metal and bolts. Eric rolled his eyes. It's not that unpredictable. He went to place a foot on top of one of the rockets at the end of the board, and with a loud snap, the rocket sank downwards. For the most part, he corrected himself. And if it does break, it's not like I can't fix it. William replied flatly with his arms crossed. What you can't fix will be my son's broken arm. Eric rolled his eyes again and changed the subject. Speaking of, he glanced over at Theo, then back at William. He is turning 16 in three days. Have you... are we gonna... No, William suddenly snapped. Theo turned his head slightly, not used to hearing that kind of sternness from his father. It wasn't your typical parental you've done something wrong sort of tone, it was different. Like, the simple two-letter word contained millions of more words behind it. Theo noticed how his father uncomfortably adjusted his glasses and jacket, a minute body language detail that signaled to him his father wasn't telling him everything. What did Eric know that he didn't? And what did it have to do with him turning 16? He knew it wasn't a party, and while he liked the idea of having a big party for his birthday, he knew it wasn't his father's style. So, what was it? William cleared his throat and told Theo. Um, hey, hey, Theo. Why don't you go get some water from the well? I'll I'll need it to wash the pots and mugs. But I got some this morning. And what about the hot- I can always reheat it, okay? There was that same sternness again. Then it melted away, and his father said, Just, Eric and I have to talk over a few things. You know, adult stuff. For the first time ever, Theo noticed how Eric remained silent. Eric was the kind of guy who always spoke his mind, sometimes even if it meant it would hurt the other person he was talking to. Something about this was different. 
He noticed how Eric's hands were folded into fists, how his eyes wandered, not necessarily making eye contact with him or his father. He saw how white his knuckles were, which only suggested that whatever they were going to talk about, it had to be something serious. But what did he have to do with it? Oh, okay, Theo awkwardly replied. I'll go get some water then. He tried to rid the tension by saying, Love you, Dad. I... William took a deep breath. I love you too. As Theo ran off to the well, Eric moved to William's side. How long do we got? Eric asked. It's about a ten minute walk, so about twenty if he doesn't come running back. William replied. So... Fifteen, got it. Eric nodded towards the door. Your office? William led Eric down a hall to his office. The walls were covered in framed black and white yellowing photographs of him and his friends. There were newspaper clippings and pictures from birthdays, celebrations, festivals, and holidays. Eric stopped for a moment when a picture caught his eye. The picture he was looking at had six people in it. From left to right, there was a woman with dragonfly wings standing with her hands on her hips, smiling at a younger version of Eric, who looked like he was in the middle of laughing as he glanced down at the short fairy. Next to Eric was a human woman whose nose reminded him of Theo's, and she stood with an arm linked around William, who stared lovingly into the woman's eyes. Next to William stood a fawn, who protectively wrapped his arms around a man with moth wings, who looked like he was trying to escape the tight grasp of the fawn. Above their heads was a banner that read, Happy Inauguration Day. You were always the sentimentalist one. He smirked at William. I can't believe you have this picture. I thought it went up in smoke when... William cleared his throat and fidgeted with the ends of his sleeves. When the house burned down, he took in a deep breath. No, uh, by some miracle, Harmony had the photos moved to the cottage the day before. Her plan was to make a chandelier or something crafty like that. I'm too logical to make sense of her craft notes, so... I hung them in order when they were taken on the walls. Eric tried to lighten the mood. You know she'd kill you for having them hung in such an organized fashion. William laughed slightly. <laughs> no, no. What she'd do is she'd call Esther to come and annoy me about it until I fix it or do something creative with it, which, dare I say, is an even worse fate. That we can agree on. Eric laughed with him. All right, let's stop being sappy and get to your office. Both men entered a room with colorful bookshelves lying the walls from floor to ceiling. Alongside the books, the shelves were stuffed with scrolls, glass ornaments, feathered pens, and little handcrafted knickknacks from Theo and William's wife, Harmony. In the center of the room was a large mahogany desk with complex carvings in a foreign language with golden embellishments. The desk had a singular leather book in the center with a blue and silver quill set at the ready if something needed to be written down. Behind the desk was a simple leather armchair that didn't take up too much space. On the wall next to the desk was an alcove with a purple and blue stained glass window designed to be used as a star chart. The bench was lined with colorful square and round pillows that looked slightly disheveled from the last time William was in his office. William sighed disappointedly as he picked up one of the pillows. Theo was here, he said as he noticed a paint stand on one of the corners. That boy will be the death of me. Yes, he will, Eric said, leaning on the front of the desk. Especially if you don't tell him about his powers. Eric, I will tell him when he's ready, William replied. When is ready for you? Eric asked, crossing his arms. Excuse me? Eric bickered back. Yeah, you heard me. When is ready for you? The kid doesn't even know how to use a sword, Will. Most kids his age have mastered the sword and have already moved on to either the pistol or a crossbow. He raised his voice slightly. You can't shield him forever. I will if I have to. And what happens when you're gone? Eric retorted. What happens when I'm gone? When Esther's gone? When Robin's gone? Because you and I both know your father will outlive us all. I suppose now would be a good time to elaborate on the complete picture of Theo and William's situation. As you know from the prologue, William ran away from the Vox Silentium to get away from his father, Spectre. But that wasn't all he was running away from. He was running away from a responsibility. The current king and ruler of the realm of Solitaire was infected with pig famine, a type of viral infection that warped the infected's face and prevented them from conceiving normal, healthy children. According to a bunch of old laws established well over 150 years ago by the founders of the Vox Lentium, if anything should happen to the king and queen's royal line, the current royal advisor's firstborn son must produce a child to become the next king or queen. Thus, Theo was destined to be the next next king of the realm of solitaire. William didn't want that life for Theo, especially with his father being in charge and not with the kind of powers his son has. For a group of dictators, what's a better king than one who can see the future? William exclaimed, I, I don't know. I don't know what kind of future he has. I can't see one beyond the life he's living now. I mean, he's safe. He has a roof over his head. He's got me. He's happy. Is he? Eric questioned. Is he happy? William shrugged. Rationally, he knew this couldn't go on forever. He knew he would have to expose Theo to the real world at some point. 
He knew he would have to tell him about his powers, but he couldn't bring himself to explain everything. He regretted not being transparent with his son when he was young. I, I can't tell him, William said. I, I know that sounds irrational, but nothing about parenting is rational. He's all I have left. I, I don't... It's not that I don't want to tell him. I, I do, because it's the logical thing to do. I just... William walked over to one of the bookshelves in the room and picked up a clay knight's chess piece, a craft Theo made for him when he was about ten years old. Eric, Theo's all I have left. He put the clay sculpture back on the shelf. My best friend was assassinated by my father. My wife was killed by my brother. The Knave Rebellion is holding on by a thread because you and Esther are running it together. He leaned against the bookshelves and shook his head. I don't want to lose Theo, too. Eric placed a hand on William's shoulder. You won't if you're honest with him. William pushed Eric's hand off. Don't you truth will set you free, me. Eric smirked. I don't necessarily believe that. I do believe the truth heals all wounds. William narrowed his eyes and said, That's... that's time. Time heals all wounds. Eric shrugged. I don't know. You're the book smart one. Using mixed metaphors has nothing to do with being book smart, William commented. See, book smart. You know what a mixed metaphor is, Eric teased, pulling a book off the shelf and hitting William's arm with it. That's... but what you just said was a mixed... Eric's smirking grew as he opened the book and pretended to read through it. Never mind. William sighed, knowing the explanation would have been a waste of his breath. Feeling at ease by Eric's nonchalance, he asked openly, How do I break it to him? I mean, he sees the future in his dreams. It's like telling a child, hey, the monster under your bed growing up was real. Not all of his dreams were exactly pleasant. I mean... Seeing the future, it's its a huge burden. Eric tossed the book aside and threw up his hands. What did I just say two seconds ago? The truth. You tell him the truth. All of it. William replied, slightly frustrated. Well, I can't just say, Hey, Theo, all of your nightmares were future premonitions of real events that actually happened because you have the magical ability to see the future. Also, your grandfather wants me dead, and it's who my friends and I went to war with for years. Not to mention that same grandfather runs a cult and wants to make you the king of the entire realm. Eric and William's head snapped to the office door when they heard the sound of ceramic mugs shattering against the ground. Theo stood in the door, hands trembling. I... I, uh, came back with water and reheated the hot chocolate. William glanced at his son, mortified by what he just had heard. Th Theo, Theo, this is not... Just let me explain. This is not... Eric chimed in. Theo, we... we need to talk, okay? I, I know it's a lot, but... I'm gonna go for a walk. Theo said with his eyes locked onto his father, betrayal hidden behind his watery emerald eyes. His father went to reach for him, and Theo quickly retracted his arms. Alone. I'm gonna go for a walk alone. He took a few steps backward, dazed after what he heard. He went to the kitchen and grabbed his sketchbook and a few pens. Behind him, William followed quickly, saying, We'll talk about it after, okay? I can explain everything, I promise. I. Theo stopped at the front door and waited politely for his father to finish. His father said, I love you. Theo nodded and said, Yeah. Then slammed the door behind him. Want to see what happens next? Subscribe and hit the notification bell to be notified when the next chapter is up. Thanks for joining me in the library today, and don't forget to leave a like on your way out. See you in the next chapter. Oh, and since, once again, if you've made it all the way through, here are some more bloopers. Ah, ah I almost fell off my chair. Let's not do that. <laughs> hey, lions, mind grabbing me a mug from the top cupboard? He focused a bit more on his son's face. What's gotten you so excited? Oh, I have to do this in a voice, don't I? <laughs> I have to do this in a voice. <laughs> I'm reading a character. I'm not reading text. Brilliantly blue eyes landed on Theo, and the man said, Hey, lions, mind grabbing me the mug from- uh, That's- uh, uh, That's his teen voice. William put an arm over Theo's shoulder, and he said, Yeah, well, he won't be- Oh, well, I don't know what voice I'm doing. I don't know what voice that was, that was but it certainly wasn't William's. <laughs> Theo, it might be unstable- as William stepped out of the way, he felt a hand on his chest. Eric sternly said, Let the kid live a little, live a little, live a little, live a little, live a little. Eric walked over to Eric. Eric walked over to Theo. He saw how white his knuckles were, which suggested that whatever they were going to talk about, it, whatever, whatever they were going to talk, whatever, the what the what the, whatever they were going to talk. William led Eric down a hall to his office. The walls were covered in framed black and wrong inflection. I would just like to note that I'm recording this at exactly nine o'clock on the night of New Year's because my New Year's resolution for 2023 was that I would post a YouTube video in 2023.
Good God, I hope, I hope I get it done before midnight. <laughs>